Okay, if you watch that last digit on the frequency counter, you can see a change in between 8 and 9, 8 and 9. Now, the frequency counter has a uh, crystal oscillator in it, and I have this connected frequency counter connected down to the uh, 60 megahertz uh, reference for the huff and puff. I just wanted to see if I had any, uh, if the digit was boggling or bobbling on the end. And uh, I think after it's on a few minutes, it stops doing that. But you got to remember, uh, let's see if it's still, it's still doing it. Uh, I was doing some experiments with the huff and puff, and I'm using the the frequency counter that's on the huff and puff, and the reference oscillator is on the huff and puff. So some of the bobbling I saw uh, is 100, say it's 100 hertz, okay? But if the digit is near the bobbling point, it could bobble at 20 hertz difference. So in really, in order to really check out your huff and puff uh, circuitry, you really need a really good uh, frequency counter. Now, I have, a, I have an HP. I'll probably get it out. But what I wanted to explain to you is just because something's digital, it doesn't mean it's accurate. And this is a case of that. In other words, if you go read the uh, specifications on the eBay frequency counter, remember, I found the... Um, the, the manual for it, remember? I told you where it was and how to find it. Well, anyway, what's, this, what's the uh, drift of that thing? Uh, is, it, is it meeting up with the oscillator? Uh, how good is that crystal oscillator module that I bought? Okay, so there's guys that say the huff and puff can get your oscillator within 10 hertz. That's really incredibly good. Uh, like an R71A uh, receiver, they have an a oscillator for the main, main board you can buy that uh, has an oven. If you open the oven up, you'll see uh, thermistors in there uh, that actually get hot and they self-regulate the temperature inside the can of that high, I think they call it a high stability oscillator module. Oh, anyway, yes, okay, and if you listen real carefully to like a tone, like uh, when you're doing fax machines, uh, fax pictures and when it's sitting idle you can slowly hear the tone of um, the idling transmitter shift because the r70 on one a was shifting and on my fax machine i had a meter that showed me that the audio was drifting so i would fine tune the uh, r71 a before each picture okay and it would come out perfectly well, anyway uh when you try to get something real uh, perfect, uh, it's to get perfect, it, it gets more and more work and more and more technology. And uh, one of the things is like uh, on, a, on a bicycle years ago, the lighter the bicycle got, the more expensive it got. And the last few pounds that you try to take off the frame, uh, a couple thousand dollars, okay, or ounces off the frame, a couple thousand dollars, everything goes the same way. But I had this engineer in RCA, and we were starting to get digital meters. And um, he made a statement. He says, just because it's digital, it doesn't mean it's accurate. And the other techs in the area are like, they, they weren't buying it. And I'm thinking, you know what, maybe he's right. If the last digit's bobbling, uh, how much is it bobbling? You know, is it bobbling a full three vol volts? You know, well, how, how accurate is the, the uh, meter overall? And... Uh, we started getting the specs out and what those meters, some of the early digital meters were for, they were, they were so you could look at it real quick for, and turn a knob somewhere and get it in the ballpark or get it set up without straining your eyes looking down on a meter with a mirror scale and a little tiny numbers. And that's what digital was all about. It was make it quicker. And as digital was coming out, stuff was becoming more transistorized it wasn't as critical as some of the tube stuff. Now, the reason our tube stuff was so critical was we wanted to test every tube exactly the same amount of current, the same amount of voltage, because you would do 10 tubes out of 10,000 tubes. And if any one of those 10 tubes failed, uh, they'd send you 20. And then if they, any of those failed, they'd send you another batch. And if they failed, any of those failed, 
then they would take the tubes out, lay them on the ground, and run them over and crush them and put them in a landfill, okay? And that's what the business I was in in RCA. I was a, a technician that set the tests up. And in the other room, uh, they put the tube in a television set. So then when, when I would take my 10 tubes down, the girl would read the parameters of the tube after so many hours and read the parameters from the ones that were in a television set. And if that didn't jive, they would, they would order more tests. And it was really annoying because the guy that had the job before me, he bodged everything. Okay, then he went to the other side and bodged everything. And he thought he was God's gift to, to life. And uh, we started having to do all these extra tests. And he would make comments loud enough that I could hear. He'd say, what's the, prof the professor come up with this week? But what happened was one of the engineers started looking at the data. And the data went from my side of the room to the other side. Because the guy shifted over from... from putting up a dynamic test to working on a TV side. So he would put a, he would put a tube up. The most the tube was getting was the filament was lit. He was just so lazy. And uh, I started running the tubes the way they were supposed to be run. And they were failing like crazy. And the engineer was in my, my room every single morning. And he knew what happened. They took some of the gold out of the tubes. And this guy fudged all the tests. So it made it look like what they were, the changes they were making to the tubes was working. So then they started taking tubes that were in storage. Uh, they had built up storage of these tubes for when they went out, when RCA went out of business and shipped it off to, out of the country. They started pulling tubes out uh, from storage and they were bad. And then they started getting letters back from people that bought the tubes. And that was a big brouhaha. And, and I, I worked my ass off trying to fix up this one little guy, one little man, and he was a little man, uh, messed up things. So uh, he was one of the people that, you know, it digital is digital, it's more accurate than an analog. No, it's not. You have to read the specifications. But let's see if this thing's still bob bobbling. It's, it's calmed down. So right away I know that either the, the oscillator module, uh, that's that's uh, 100 hertz. That's it's bobbling. Or you, it could be on a, a, right on the threshold. So there's a 20 hertz uh, bobble or shift in the oscillator or the, um, the module or the the frequency counter module itself has to warm up. So that's pretty funny stuff. But you know, and I'm doing these quick tests. Well, I didn't fix it. Well, didn't really get any better. Well, meanwhile, my test equipment or the equipment I'm using actually has uh, a, a, something that's drifting in it that shouldn't be drifting. And I'm down to just the module for the, uh, the uh, frequency counter module and a, a, an oscillator module. And something drifts for the first few minutes. And these are the things that when you work with something and you do experiments, you've got to use scientific method. You've got to make sure what you're using isn't causing the problem you're seeing. Now, so now I know that uh, getting this, this huff and puff down to 10 hertz, uh, it, it, it requires some warm-up if it's the crystal module. And if it's the frequency counter module, uh, I have no ch uh, shot over that. But in other words, I know I've got the huff and puff within 100 hertz, okay, which is pretty good uh, for receiving, like, um, it, it'll be okay for sideband. Um, CW and then it does settle down but what it'll kill you uh, at is if you got a receiver that's dual conversion and you have some really good filters in there like a, a, a 300 Hertz CW filter so if if the, uh, the receiver drifts 500 Hertz well that 300 Hertz CW filter is going to stop passing the tone you're going to you'll be copying the guy and he'll get he'll be getting weaker and weaker and weaker and not because he's fading out, it's because your your IF and your radio is shifting over. It's warming up. And that's why uh, a lot of people really like the new digital t uh, radios, okay? And they use a better oscillator, and then, they, you know, they, everything's synthesized. But the synthesized uh, receivers have a, a high noise floor. Unless you pay a lot of money, 
and that's that's the, the one of the the, the uh, circular logic problems you start going into. But whatever is drifting has settled down. Now I could get my frequency counter out and find out is it that frequency module that's drifting. And what I would do is put the uh, the frequency counter the frequency module on the HP frequency counter and let it run and let it all warm up and then get the frequency counter get it where it doesn't bobble it doesn't drift and then turn the oscillator module off and let it cool down and then turn that on without turning off the frequency counter scientific method and then if it moves then I know the reference frequency module oscillator module for this project drifts uh, let's say for five minutes when you first turn it on so anytime you're doing an experiment you got to wait five minutes be before everything settles down before you now go after the drifting caused by something else okay and that's scientific method you can't assume anything like they, uh, Ken Recor said just because it's digital doesn't mean it's more accurate than an analog meter and uh, how, how he, why he was saying this was he put me in charge of calibration uh, when we started getting all those tubes failing uh, the engineers started kicking back see these engineers were getting bonuses based on how they could cut costs in the tubes and they're going to defend what they've done to those tubes even though they know they screwed up so they start saying well you guys don't calibrate your equipment so we start taking meters and 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 taking them down to the calibration lab and that was a funny thing uh, the calibration lab had two giant five-foot Simpson meters, meter movements. They're like Simpsons. And they had different uh, modules that plugged in, and those were the uh, the dropping resistors for the meter movement. The meter movement across, let, let, let's say it was three foot across. Giant freaking meter movement. And another guy sitting at one. They sat, they had these chairs in front of these meters where they sat. And they didn't talk to each other. It was the same as the two Tonys down in the, uh, the parts bin. They, over the years, they got tired of each other, and they wouldn't talk. They would sit in the same room together. Well, these two meter guys, you would come down, and uh, you'd, sh you'd give them a, an analog meter, and the guy would say to you, first thing he says, which way is this meter going to sit? Is it going to stand up, or is it going to lay down? So on the meter, when we got into calibration, we, we'd have a, a sticker. It says, uh, within 1% laying down, prone. I think prone was, well, anyway... So he would, he would check the meter out several places on the scale, and then he'd give you a new calibration sticker. And then i have to walk two or three blocks all the way back from the meter lab. Originally, they made me take a trolley to the meter lab, but I got them to, I talked them out of that. It was waiting for the trolley, getting in the trolley, and then driving to the, to the, to the meter lab. Uh, and it was two blocks the other way from the, from the trolley. It was crazy stuff. Well, anyway, so we started calibrating everything. And that's when you learn that so just because something's digital, uh, it doesn't mean it's more accurate. And the other thing, too, is uh, if it hasn't been calibrated, somebody could have blown or sizzled or singed one of the dropping resistors on the front end of the meter. So the meter is actually reading wrong. Uh, I found some of those over the years. Uh, guys, what they do is uh, they, they, they have the meter on the wrong scale, and they turn the power on, and they fry some of the resistors in it. On the scale you're going to use and they didn't burn it open they just uh, carbonized them and uh, you're getting bad readings and it's a digital meter so in your mind you say it's digital it's got to be right not necessarily you know but let's see if it's bobbling now now it is settled down okay and that's what I'd expect okay but now I learned something and like I said I gotta get the other frequency counter out and decide whether um, it's the frequency mo counter module from eBay or the, one of those. Um, let me show you one of these things. One of these modules. Okay. Uh, do, they, do they warm up? You know, there's no. These I don't think have an oven in them. I do have ones that, that um, XVCOs. I think it's got an X in front of the number for. Uh, uh, yeah, look it up. It, it, there's ones with that, that, that actually have a, an oven inside that after they warm up, they, uh, they stabilize the frequency. So, so we, we, did, we did learn something, uh, you know, wait, sitting here waiting for 
um, one of these to come today. Uh, I have a 50 megahertz coming today. Actually, it's coming really quick. Uh, it's out for delivery. Uh, took two days to get here from California. I hit the I hit the airplane and everything just right. And that's what I was waiting for, hoping to get rid of the bobble I had. But now I know some of the bobble uh, is from um, one of the, either the oscillator module or the frequency counter module. Okay, so uh, I'm getting closer and closer to uh, a 10 hertz resolution on an oscillator. I think that's it. All right, that's it.